presentation. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is David uh, Levitt-Power, and I'm uh, I'm uh, the chair of this uh, seminar uh, series together with my uh, colleagues who are uh, part of the Tigre uh, Consortium on Trust and Regulation. And today with us, uh, Filippa Primavera de Filippi, uh, who will give a talk on blockchain as confidence uh, machine. Filippa, uh, welcome and many thanks for your willingness to participate. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so I will uh, share my screen. You are co host now, so you can do it. Okay. Okay, do you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Um, you can take, you can even take it bigger and it's excellent, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, yeah, this is like a, a paper that uh, uh, we have co-written with uh, Russell Rager and uh, Marshall Manan. And um, the idea is to illustrate um, what is the what is the function of uh, blockchain technology and to kind of uh, contrast it with the usual narrative of uh, uh, blockchain being this trustless technology or blockchain as a trust machine um, and what we claim is that actually what uh, what what blockchain technology actually does is to uh, produce confidence in a particular system and it is because of this increased confidence that then we can re-establish some, uh, um, some layers of trust on top of this. Um, so the, 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 the initial, uh, the first conception and elaboration of blockchain technology what we, was with Bitcoin, which was as a response of this uh, a crisis of trust, uh, most notably with like the uh, 2008 financial crisis um, and the, the, the erosion of trust that we had in like financial institutions. And so the idea with uh, uh, Bitcoin was to respond to this, uh, to this lack of trust, uh, not by restoring or by reintroducing mechanisms of trust, but actually by uh, eliminating completely the need for there to be any trust in those institutions uh, with what has came to be called this trustless technology. Um, and of course, there is a lot of questions around this qualification of uh, trustless, like what, what does it actually mean uh, for this technology to be trustless? Um, and uh, the extent to which um, Yes, it is possible perhaps to eliminate trust in one particular field, but then uh, who can trust the, the technology, right? Like the, the idea with uh, the blockchain is really to move away the trust into from the institution and the individuals towards the trust in the technology. But then there is all this question that, uh, that comes about, which is, well, uh, what are, why are we trusting this technology and who are the new actors that we need to trust when we're actually deciding to trust this technology. So uh, the way the presentation is structured is uh, first we're gonna address uh, the distinction between uh, trust and confidence. Uh, and then we will look at how blockchain technology actually acts as a confidence machine. Uh, and then we will see that actually, even though it, it, uh, it might be a confidence machine, then it's, there is still trust needed somewhere. And these, these relate to the underlying governance of the technology. So trust versus confidence, two different concepts. Um, there is actually no single, uh, like it, we did like a lot of literature review in order to go and analyze like all the different uh, ways in which those two different worlds have been defined by different uh, authors and there is no uh, specified definition that is uh, that is acknowledged as like official but there is there is a general gist uh, out of this um, and the, the idea is really like this is a multifaceted uh, social phenomena and um, uh, there is like a very uh, interesting actually paper uh, by Lumen that distinguishes uh, these two this is kind of like the 
had to abide by in terms of definition. And there is this, this, uh, this idea that trust is essentially based on um, delegating uh, power, delegating uh, decision making to a third party, uh, delegating a task. And uh, um, trust actually put me that delegates this task into a vulnerable position towards the person towards whom I've delegated because uh, I'm, I cannot be sure that this person will not breach my expectation. And so it's this kind of risk taking and is this type of vulnerability uh, that uh, is addressed via trust. And so if I don't trust the person, I will not put myself into this vulnerable position. I will not take the risk of the person betraying my expectation. If I do trust, then I, I'm, I'm willing to, to delegate. And so this means that um, it, it actually enables, it, trust can, be, can facilitate a lot uh, my life because if, I, if I'm surrounded by people I trust, I can delegate more and more tasks and not constantly have to monitor and to verify and to, or to create additional uh, constraints in order to ensure that this trust is not breached. Um, and then, so what actually uh, caused trust? So trust as a, as, a, as a particular psychological attitude, um, but also possibly as a rational choice, which is like when there is too much complexity and I know I cannot deal with anything, it is actually rational to trust um, some another, but then there is like different factors that of course will increase uh, the, the, the notion of the, or the, the phenomenon of trust, which depends on uh, how much interaction I had and whether there will be in, uh, repeated interaction, um, the reliability and the predictability of the, of the, of the interaction, and also like the, um, the ability for me to control or to survey or like to have access to what's actually happening uh, on the on the other side. And then if we look at uh, confidence, it's a slightly different phenomenon. Um, when, when, when there is confidence, then there is no, there is a perception at least that there is no risk, that there is no vulnerability because um, I am confident in something when I think I know, right? So, uh, there is no choice between do I trust this person or do I not trust this person. Uh, basically, my confidence is such that I don't need to choose. I'm just confident that those things uh, and those person will operate in a particular way. And so Simel defined this as this kind of weak inductive knowledge, which is like because of my own experience, because I've seen and I've experienced things uh, over time, I create this knowledge, this internal knowledge of confidence about how things are, uh, operate. Uh, but also confidence can be derived from um, an, an external uh, system, what, which because I have confidence, for instance, in the scientific, uh, or because I trust the scientific uh, community, then I, I, I can be confident of like the law of physics, even though I don't fully understand it myself. But basically, the idea with confidence is that there is no risk that and that the thing that I'm relying upon will eventually uh, breach my expectation. And um, yeah, so it's it's not a decision. It's not like I decide it's just like I can decide to trust or not to trust. I don't decide whether I'm confident or not. It's just my 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 own self um, impression. And um, and also uh, whereas trust is something that is addressed towards a particular actor which has agency. Uh, confidence is not confidence, it's just like anything around me, like that the sun rises in the morning. I don't, I, I don't trust that the sun will, will rise. Uh, and then the interesting thing is that there is also this interplay between the two. Um, so trust and confidence can feed into each other uh, in the sense that oftentimes the reason I'm confident in things, unless I can unless I have experienced everything from my own personal experience, but oftentimes confidence emerged from trust in existing institutions. So when I enter into a contract with a person, I, I, I am confident that the contract will go through uh, because I trust the legal system uh, to intervene in case the contract doesn't go through. Or when I, when I give my money to a, to a bank, 
I don't need to trust the bank to the fullest extent because I know that there's a lot of regulation and etc. So because I trust the system around, um, I can be confident for the things inside. And, um, and also vice versa, meaning that uh, trust can actually be increased uh, when confidence exists because the existence of confidence. So if, if I were to interact with a person and I have no confidence, for instance, if I have to go to a doctor for an operation, uh, I, tr I trust the doctor, but I trust the doctor also because I'm confident that the doctor is skilled because uh, because it has a particular license and that license has been given by an expert system, which is the medical uh, uh, community, which I trust. So there is like a lot of layers between confidence of trust that uh, interact with each other and can boost each other. Um, so that is very, uh, very short introduction of those two very uh, complex concepts. Now, the, the question is then um, like, the, the blockchain technology, what, what we claim is that it's, uh, it's actually, it's not, it's not just eliminating uh, trust, it's actually eliminating trust as a collateral effect of the fact that it's actually increasing confidence. And, um, and so we have like all the, like, all the, like the, the, the system, like the, the financial system, the, the, the public uh, institution, companies, etc. Those are all a uh, very complex system that, uh, that we need to trust. But of course, uh, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of different mechanisms that can be used in order to increase the trust in those institutions. Um, and uh, the, the idea, and this is what we, 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 we rely on or like most of like governments and traditional institutions is like we we create particular system of transparency to increase the verifiability we increase like the constraint the check and balance the regulatory aspect uh, so as to actually enable the system to be more trustworthy and to, so we we we're increasing we, we find mechanisms of increasing a little bit the confidence within the manner in which those institutions operate so that we can more easily create trust relationship toward them. And, um, and so with version technology, the idea is, uh, well, let's, let's get rid of trust altogether. Let's create a system in which we no longer need trust, uh, shifting trust from people to math. Um, and, and the idea is really like, we don't need to trust because we can verify. And so this these vulnerability uh, and this risk that is associated with trust doesn't exist anymore because everything can be constantly seen and verified. Um, but this is like a very negative definition of blockchain as trust, meaning like it, it like it's defined as something that it removes, but it's not defined as something that it actually produces and creates. And um, and so when what what we're trying to 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 our claim here is that we can actually positive definition, which is blockchain is not a trustless technology, it's actually a confidence machine. And so it's not about eliminating trust, but it's actually about maximizing confidence and indirectly then reducing the need for trust, right? And, uh, and the idea is that basically, before I'm gonna interact with a particular system, I need to, I need to fill up my, a particular amount of either trust or confidence. And so the lower is the amount of confidence in, this, in the system, the higher is the amount of trust that I need to, to, to compensate. And, the, and but as I increase and increase and increase the confidence in the system that I only need to trust that much. And therefore it's easier. It's like, it's those, those trust relationships are easier to create because there is so much confidence underneath. Um, and so how is blockchain technology actually contributing to increasing confidence? Uh, so first of all is like relying on uh, mathematics and cryptography. So uh, there is like all those crypto cryptographic primitive that it is based on whether it's like a hashing function, the public and private key cryptography things, which actually create, um, create like a, an incorruptible system and uh, create like a verifiable system. So we can always, always uh, observe and compare. Um, and then there is like all these, uh, economic incentives that are integrated into the system of like with the, the notion of distributed consensus and so forth, which, which is such that 
the, there is no way for any single actor to actually tamper with the system. There needs to be like an unanimity of, uh, like of all the consensus between all actors and therefore none of those single actors need to be trusted. And uh, therefore we can be confident that it's gonna operate according to the protocol unless there is a very, very strong collision between all the parties. Um, and then there is like all the, um, the deterministic computation. So it's not just about like the verifiability of the transaction, but it's also by incorporating specific uh, smart contracts directly into the technological infrastructure, we know that uh, those, those software those will be executed exactly as planned and no one can tamper with the, with the execution of this software and no one can stop it or even influence it. So the, the whole infrastructure and, and then of course also like the open sourceness of the, of the code so that we know exactly how the protocol has been described and so forth. Uh, so all these contribute to actually increasing the confidence in the way in which any system that is relying on a blockchain will operate. Um, and so the idea is that this is very useful because as institutions start to adopt uh, this technology, then we can increase the degree of confidence in the way in which they will operate. And therefore, we might actually be able uh, subsequently to, to trust, to reestablish or to create higher degrees of trust towards those institutions because of the underlying confidence in the information system on which they rely. Um, and then, so of course, uh, this is like, so talking of blockchain technology as a confidence machine is, uh, is very useful because it's actually, it's more useful than saying that it's trustless. It's actually explaining how it's, how it's creating confidence and therefore potentially uh, reducing the need for trust, but there is still a need of trust that remains. And, uh, and then the question then is like, of course, the reason we can be, the reason there is confidence in the system is because we trust something else. And what we trust is we trust that uh, everything that was described in this schema, that all those technological guarantees actually exist. And the reason that those guarantees exist is because the governance of the underlying net really um, managed, right? And so, Basically, we need to actually see blockchain technology for what it is, which is it's not just a technology, it's a technology that is managed uh, by specific actors, specific individuals and operators. And so the, the confidence in blockchain technology actually requires some degree of trust in all those actors which are operating the technology. Uh, and so who are those actors? So we have, of course, the the core developers and the open source contributors, which are the ones that are building the technology. And, um, and, and then if we look at the governance here, it's, it's not at all a distributed governance. It's actually quite uh, technocratic in the sense that there is a very small number of uh, developers that get to decide uh, how the, the system will evolve um, which changes can be incorporated into the, the repository. And, uh, and many of the decisions are usually technical decisions. It's like, we need to fix a bug, we need to add a feature, but there is also a lot of decision that can be uh, more political and contentious um, as we have seen in the past where uh, when there is like, for instance, uh, a, a transaction that is, uh, that is seen or that is perceived by some people as being uh, an illegitimate transaction, then um, the question of whether the protocol of the blockchain should be changed in order to fix the issue that was caused by this transaction. And this is things that the solution that will be adopted are, are solutions that are developed and then incorporated by uh, the group of developers. There is then of course, all the maintainers of the network. So the miners and the validators. And here the governance is quite quite distributed in a, in a sense, even though over time we can see how there is like a very strong concentration of power uh, in the end of like some uh, hashing power than others. And, um, but the interesting thing here is that uh, the, the miner, so there is some kind of like uh, interesting separation of power between the miners and the validators because uh, the miners can 
find the blocks and uh, and and you need a lot of resources to to find uh, to mine the, the the blocks of a blockchain. But every block needs to be validated by the validators, and so there is no incentive for the miners to 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 create blocks that will not be validated. So there is like a nice even though the decentralization of the mining uh, is uh, is somehow failing as it gets more and more concentrated, the validators are there to actually act as a counter power. Uh, then we have like the end users and uh, the token holders. So um, the end user which can influence, they have very little influence actually, but all they can do is basically exit. Uh, they can decide that if there is a, a particular blockchain that is changing or that is evolving in a way that they do not like, they can just quit and move somewhere else and thereby reducing the demand uh, for that particular blockchain and potentially reducing the value of the cryptocurrency associated with it. And the token holders, they have actually bought exit and voice because there is a lot of uh, system within the blockchain uh, that actually uh, relies on a pluto an explicitly plutocratic system whereby you vote because we can because it's a pseudonymous system and there, there can be no one person one vote then the alternative is to rely on token holding and so the more token one holds then the more they have a voice in the governments um and uh, and then there is those new intermediaries so uh the mining pools which are aggregating a huge huge amount of uh, hashing power into the hand of a very few operators and today most of the like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and most of the main uh, blockchains are actually controlled by less than five mining pool, which is quite easy to collude potentially. Uh, and then there are the super nodes. And when, when I say super nodes, I'm really talking about uh, the cryptocurrency exchanges or the, uh, the custodian wallets, the blockchain explorer, or, or even just like the commercial operators, uh, which need to choose, especially in the case of contentious fork, they need to pick a particular blockchain that they will decide to follow. Um, and, um, and therefore they have like, even though they have no actual influence on the network, they, they might not even be mining and contributing to the network, but the choice of which, as opposed to the end user, which can just exit, uh, they can also just exit. But the fact that they exit means that all the users that rely on those, those, those services will follow the same choice. And so all of students, they have like an incredible amount of influence, especially the, the cryptocurrency exchanges and the custodian wallet because they actually hold the currencies of their customers. And so the fact that they decide to recognize one version of the park rather than the other will have huge influence on what the user will pick. Um, and then we have like the experts. So uh, whether those are like the founders, the, the influencers, the people that are very technologically savvy and therefore really respected in their opinions, the, uh, the people that are just like very vocal on the social media and therefore they, they can actually influence the public opinion, which also are not necessarily uh, active participants on the network, but they can strongly uh, influence decision making uh, with respect to those, to those networks. And then finally, there is laws and regulation, which are like, um, indirectly uh, affecting the, the governance of, uh, of those technology. Um, one, by providing legitimacy to some blockchain rather than others, or to actually create laws that will indirectly shape the way in which the decision maker, the people that actually make decisions in the governance, will, will interact by fear, for instance, of like legal liability. Uh, and then finally, those, those, those regulators can also, while they cannot regulate all the actors of the network, they have kind of a strong influence on the, the super nodes, on the, on the actual operator that, that operates in their own jurisdiction. And so even though there is a lot of claims that blockchain technology exists a little bit outside of the legal system, actually they, they are part of this large and uh, uh, multi-facet polycentric governance structure uh, of a blockchain. And so this, this leads us to um, the question about uh, the rule of uh, code versus the rule of law. Uh, so as a short introduction, the rule of law essentially just means like uh, no one should be above the law. Uh, that means that the law should be one, transparent and accessible to everyone, but also 
there should be like everyone should be equal uh and whether whether you're the sovereign or whether you're a, uh just a citizen or whether you're a company everyone is subject to exactly the same law and everyone should have access to uh, legal remedies if necessary and of course that the judiciary should be independent from the government and uh, and this is contrasted with like the real bylaw uh, which actually refers to the instrumentalization of law by uh, by the sovereign as a tool for political power and so in that case the sovereign is actually above the law um, and so when, when we move into like the the internet the cyberspace and so forth like so initially there was this vision that the cyberspace is neither governed by the rule of law, neither by the rule by law, and that it was actually this independent space that cannot be regulated because governments did not have the capacity uh, uh, to exert their sovereignty over it. And then, of course, we've seen that further concentration of power um, into like the hand of those few online operators uh, somehow made it actually much easier to regulate the internet. We don't need to regulate the whole internet. We just need to regulate all those centralized uh, cluster of uh, of power. And so today we can say that the internet is actually ruled by code, meaning that uh, there is this kind of uh, instrumentalization of the code in as a tool of political power. And the the operators of those platforms they are actually the ultimate sovereign, and they can actually change this code as they wish at any time uh, with no form of check and balances, with no need for accountability and so forth. And so they are the functional sovereign of their own technological platform. And, and when we move back into the blockchain, then we could, we could say that because of the fact that actually no one wants a blockchain has been deployed or wants a particular application has been deployed on a blockchain, no one has actually had the capacity to change it unless there is this distributed consensus around. Then we could we could claim that in, in the case of a blockchain, we're actually talking of rule of code, meaning that no one is above the code and the protocol is the, the king. Uh, and everyone needs, including the founders, needs to abide by those by those protocol rules. Um, and so if we if we go back to like compare with like the early uh, vision of the internet as this autonomous space, uh, there is a lot of claims that uh, the, the blockchain technology actually is illegal, that it, it, it exists outside of the purview of the law. Um, and, and that creates a distinction because we are, we are always talking about code as law, uh, but there is a distinction between code as law by code and Actually, be regulated by identifying the operators that that operate that code, and therefore indirectly getting into the the, the regulation of how those those architecture operate. Whereas when we are in the real off code, then because those online operators disappear, then it becomes more difficult to understand the extent to which we can intervene, uh, to which like the law can actually shape and influence the construction of this code that will become the law. Um, and so the big question then is like, uh, uh, when we are in the rule of code, then what type of technological guarantees can be incorporated within this code so as to create some degrees of constitution, constitutional constraint? And so those guarantees are the one provided today by the blockchain is like the decentralization, is the transnationality, the resiliency of the system, uh, the non-coercivity of the system in the sense that uh, no one can oblige anyone to adopt the technology as opposed to today. Uh, if Facebook changes the rules, then every user of Facebook is automatically adopting those, those changes in, 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 its, in, its, uh, in its application. Whereas in the blockchain, any rule that is changed still need to be accepted by the user that need to update their, uh, their client in order to follow the new, the new protocol. And then there's the temper resistance, the transparency, non repudiability um, and the guarantee of execution for the case of blockchain that come with uh, uh, smart contract capacities. But then, but then we can see that, and, and all, all, those, all those are contributing to creating this very strong confidence in the way in which the system operates. But then we have seen uh, in the past, we have seen already in, uh, situations 
in which this confidence was broken. Um, and uh, uh, basically because of, uh, of, uh, of non a bug that was a, an unknown feature for some, uh, some people managed to uh, exploit a particular piece of software on, on Ethereum and that uh, they managed to take uh, about like $50 million out of the, out of the contract. And so this created a very interesting debate within the Ethereum community about whether these actually qualified as a theft uh, and therefore there was a justifiable intervention to be had uh, because the people entering this contract did not expect this functionality to exist. Uh, and on the, other, on the other side, there are the people that were actually, actually the code is the law and uh, no one should be above the code. And therefore, even though it was unexpected, this person didn't do anything wrong. This person just used the software at, as it was being codified and, uh, and therefore no intervention will ever be considered to be legitimate. And so the, the conclusion is because there is no coercion, uh, the conclusion is that a big portion of the community decided to amend and modify the Ethereum protocol in order to re re reverse this transaction, in order to take the money back and give it back to the original holder. But a portion of the network refused this intervention and therefore the network split forked into two different uh, network, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Uh, one that has, that has infringed uh, the rules of the protocol in order to restore uh, the funds and one that did not accept this modification to the protocol. And so if we look at it, we can, we can look at this as an actual state of exception, uh, uh, which is in just like in the, in the traditional, uh, in the physical world, we, we have like sometimes the rule of law can actually be uh, displaced on the name of a state of exception and, um, and then restored after the emergency is gone. And so in the same way here, there was an emergency. And so the rule of code has been displaced uh, for the sake of the state of exception. But the, the interesting question then is like, there was an obvious departure from the traditional protocol rules of Ethereum, but it's very unclear who is the sovereign. Like who was the person or the group of people that actually could implement this decision? There is no clear answer as to, because there is not just one person that, that was actually part of this, um, of this decision making. And so the, 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 then the answer to like, how, how can we actually uh, regulate a blockchain based system is not via the traditional means of regulation, but it's via governments. And therefore it's very important to understand uh, this system, how, how it is being governed, because the way in which it will be governed will affect the confidence that we can actually construct throughout this system. Um, and so we can see how um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very complex uh, question because uh, blockchain is essentially this very polycentric uh, structure in which we have, uh, on the one hand, there is the technical layer and this is like governed by the miners and by the validators, which are, are actively participating into the network. But then there is also the social layer, which is oftentimes forgotten, but actually the social layer is extremely important because it's the one that can influence and modify the protocols. Um, and this is so the developer, this is all the influencers, this is the commercial operator. And then we have the governments and the government can try uh, to intervene at different points, but the government cannot intervene at all the points at the same time. And that's where like, it's really this kind of, this fight between all those different actors, which are all trying to convince each other to follow, to, uh, to accept the same shelling point, to all agree and coordinate themselves ar around a particular outcome because everyone has a benefit to coordinate around the same outcome, but no one has the ultimate say and is just a power dynamics and, and a game of influence amongst all those actors. And so essentially um, the, 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 the governance of a uh, blockchain based system is, is really like, uh, there is like all those different clusters and uh, they have different interests, oftentimes conflicting interests. Uh, and yet they have this commonality of interest towards maintaining the network operative because everyone benefits from that. And so there is like all these 
uh, mutual influences and interdependencies that come and try to shape and establish this, uh, this common set of fields. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 the main idea is uh, in order for actually having this, this real confidence in the system and in, in order for blockchain to be considered to be a confidence machine, there needs to be the, a certain degree of constitutional constraint, like in order to create this proper rule of code. And those constitutional constraints cannot be only on-chain. So we already have a lot of constitutional constraint on-chain, but because of the possibility of this external system of actors to influence the protocol and to, and to affect the on-chain governments, then we also need to establish those constitutional constraint in the off-chain world, like in the in the social layer, because that's only once we will have this proper governance, this proper external governance of the blockchain, that we will be sure that we can be confident then, because we trust the governance of the blockchain, then we can we can be confident in the operation of the blockchain, and therefore we can use this technology in order to uh, boost or, or help us re-establish uh, trust relationship towards wh whoever are the institution or the operators adopting this technology. So I think I can I can finish here. Um, and uh, I don't know if we if there is like Q and A or discussion. Yeah, of course we have uh, we can have uh, discussion. And thank you very very much for fascinating uh, presentation. I I'm sure I will need uh, to see the video again in order to grasp the concept. But uh, let's open it uh, for discussion. And may I ask you to remove the slides so we can all see you. Yes. And then uh, I'm taking questions and comments also are possible in the chat uh, chat box. Uh, who wants to go first? Um, Owen, do you want to go first? I see Owen is uh, a little bit uh, strong. Hello, so uh, let me let me ask the first question. Um, uh, and I see uh, Al Alfio is also wants to ask a question and go after me. Uh, my question is, um, can you please uh, summarize how the, the, the different polycentric, how trust and con con confidence are going into polycentric, uh, are, 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 are connecting uh, into the polycentric governance of blockchain? So how does it, um, how does the concept that you started with and the distinctions that you made are really working or needed at all um, in the working of uh, blockchain in, in, in the community? Um, is there, are there a moment of trust uh, enhancement, confidence building, or oh, no, is this something of uh, you know, the forced uh, movement? We have the technology, and we don't need so much confidence and trust anymore between the actors, the different actors. Um, this is my question. If you can answer it, I will be appreciated. I'm not sure I fully understand. I'm gonna try and answer and you tell me if I probably understand the question. Um, you're, you're asking whether the blockchain communities, existing communities actually uh, recognize uh, the needs or the not need for confidence and trust within the, the governance? Uh, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, okay. How about trust come into the discussion, confidence yeah, yeah, yeah. to the action? Etc. Yeah. So I think it's it's actually, um, so it depends on the communities, first of all. Um, I would say that within the blockchain community, like there is like different trends and like for instance, Bitcoin, uh, is very still is still very much on the uh, trustless, uh, in the sense that uh, the, there is there is there is not much uh, acknowledgement, I guess, that um, that 
there needs that this confidence, this this trustlessness derived from the creation of confidence. This is very clear. This is like it's. I, I think most most community do not use this terminology. They don't distinguish between trust and confidence. They just call it trustless. But in in given the definition that we have uh, defined for uh, confidence, what they are actually talking about is is confidence. And uh, so the Bitcoin community is very much into like trustless technology, confidence machine, and that's about it. Um, and uh, and not not fully recognize these uh, issues that uh, that emerge within like the off chain governance, like the the underlying network. And and the reason is actually because uh, there has there have been very few interventions. Uh, the Bitcoin com because the Bitcoin community is so much. Uh, pro immutability and like there is actually the reason is that there is almost confidence or very high level of trust that the bitcoin community will not change the protocol right and therefore those questions become uh like less important to debate because there is a high degree of confidence that actually it's not gonna it's never gonna be an issue um, which is not necessarily the case because it has actually, it has been an issue and there has been uh, quite several forks of Bitcoin uh, during the scaling debate and so forth. So it has happened, but the official Bitcoin has never moved, have never changed, and 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 I think there is a lot of expectation that this will continue to be the case. Um, in the Ethereum community, it's very different because the Ethereum community actually had to address at least two big crises. Uh, so the first one I mentioned in the talk is like the, the DAO hack. Um, and the DAO hack was, was actually the Ethereum community for the first time, perhaps, realizing there are exceptions. We need to account for the state of exception. And therefore, we need to think about how would we intervene in the case of a state of exception, right? And um, and so, and, and it has led to an intervention and therefore all of a sudden it, it became obvious to everyone that we cannot be confident that is never gonna change because it has changed because the community has decided to actually modify the protocol for a pure, non, not a technical issue for a pure uh, economic slash political question, right? And then there was uh, shortly afterwards, there was another incident, uh, there was another bug uh, that led to 300,000, uh, 300 million dollars uh, being frozen uh, because of someone just like doing like a mismanagement uh, with some of the smart contracts. And, uh, and again, the question posed itself and the question was, what do we do? Shall we again, once again, change the protocol in order to unfreeze those funds? Or shall we just let it be because because it's a blockchain and a blockchain should not be changed every every time there is a problem because otherwise it's gonna change all the time. And in this case, the decision, and that, but that creates so much discussion, a huge amount of discussion about what do we do? Uh, because this time was no longer a, a state of exception because there was no urgency. Um, it is just likely a different issue. So they could take as much time as possible to actually decide and think about it. And because it has already happened before, and that was like so exceptional. It was actually, let's that's that's a one-time shot, you know. But actually making it again raised this question of like we we are explicitly acknowledging the fact that uh, we are uh, to a large extent there is a sovereign. We don't know who the sovereign is, but if we if we create a procedure by which we can decide when to intervene, all of a sudden we're actually creating. A governance system we're explicit putting it explicitly and so forth and so the decision was not to intervene even though there was much more money uh in the in the the problem in what involving much more money and the the fix was extremely simple and like the technical fix was obvious non-controversial uh the community decided not to intervene because that will break those expectations that will actually be a breach of trust in the immutability of the blockchain and they didn't, they couldn't do it because then they would have lost so much legitimacy as a blockchain um, that it will no longer be a confidence machine if there is a governance structure that can choose when to modify it, right? Mm -hmm. And so in order to maintain this confidence structure, this trustlessness, uh, the decision was we have to let this one pass. We cannot, we cannot intervene. 
uh, because because people trust us not to intervene. And, uh, and even though a lot of people would have been very happy to get the money back, many of the people that haven't got the money locked, they understand. They understand that uh, as you engage with that system, there is all those technological guarantees that come about, which also involve the non-reversibility of transaction. And so you know that you cannot go to your bank and just like uh, ask for a transaction to be canceled because because you decided because you don't want this trust actor to exist right so it's kind of this trade-off of like if you want full confidence you also lose uh you lose a little bit of uh of governability and of possibility to intervene yeah so well, basically yeah the 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 ethereum community i think is the one that really is addressing those questions uh and and i don't know if i don't think they really address it using this vocabulary, but they definitely are addressing those questions. Excellent. Uh, I have more questions, but I'll give, uh, I'll give your first go on, please. Thank you. Thank you, Prima. Thank you, Primavera, for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you the following questions. You mentioned that blockchain is uh, transnational, but uh, some nations have different uh, legal structures. So, is a code by technology universal? Uh, and uh, if it yes, how can technology address any regulatory arbitrage? Um, so yeah, I mean it's uh, I, will, I will I don't know about universal, but it's definitely uh, uh, not accounting for uh, national jurisdictions. So anyone that decide to Act to interact with the system is by definition accepting to be ruled by this code, right? So I, I, I choose to use a blockchain. I know the protocol of this blockchain is gonna dictate my, my, the, the operation of the system, right? Um, and then the, the and, and that's why like there is a lot of discussion about the illegality, about the fact that it, it cannot be uh, regulated by, by um, by governments or uh, regulatory authority. Um, the, and I mean, yes, like people are using it for, uh, I, I wouldn't call it even regulatory arbitrage. They are using it in order to uh, escape from specific regulation. And like the ICO has been a very obvious example of this, which is, well, we want to, we want to evade away from securities laws and so we're going to create those blockchain tokens and those blockchain tokens can be purchased by anyone um, independently of where I'm located. And so, of course, well, if I'm in the US, uh, I, I still like I, the like most of the token sales were, were not happening in the US because the, 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 the security uh, commission was extremely um, violent and aggressive towards the token sale. But as long as you 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 put yourself in a different country and you don't sell those tokens to Americans, then it's fine. So there is, of course, like the regulatory, the, the, the government can regulate the actors, the people that operate into their own jurisdiction. But because it's like a transnational technology, like the internet, like I can locate myself where I want. It doesn't matter where I'm physically located. And then, you know, I just need to incorporate a company in Gibraltar or Singapore or whatnot, where there are more lenient jurisdictions. And, uh, and then it's actually quite easy to, to escape from a particular regulatory framework. Yeah. Thank you. Ivan, uh, please. You unmute yourself. Uh, thank you for a very informative uh, and concise uh, talk. Uh, I have uh, two uh, questions. First, would you agree that in permission the blockchain, the the function of trust is much more uh, um, important than confidence? And the second question is, uh, what are the, what do you think is the um, power uh, balance between the validators and the, and the mining pools, especially when we see that, uh, that mining in Bitcoin is uh, highly concentrated. Um, I'm gonna answer the second question second. What was the first question, sorry? 
the first uh, is, um, would you agree that trust plays much more important role in permissioned blockchain versus confidence ah. um, in comparison to, in comparison to, uh, to the permissionless or to uh, public uh, blockchain? Um, to some extent, uh, uh, yes, I think that, um, I mean, the, the confidence layer, I think is the same, but uh, the underlying trust for the governance uh, is obviously, it requires much more trust um, in a permission blockchain because there is less actors and oftentimes they kind of know each other. So it means like they could uh, collude more easily. Uh, so you need to trust them. Uh, at the same time, I would like to add a little bit of a nuance in this answer because I think that there is also, um, at least in a consortium blockchain, you actually know who are the actors, you know who are the people deciding. So it's easier to trust them, first of all. And secondly, oftentimes there is a proper, explicit and well-constructed governance structure. And so I, I might, because I, 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 at least I can see there is more accountability on who is making which decisions. And, and so there is I will also a way in which I might be able to more easily uh, trust a permission blockchain, if I trust the actors that are involved in it, uh, than a public blockchain in which I really don't know what's happening. I, I, I have very little visibility. I don't fully understand all those power dynamics and all these like polycentric systems um, are very hard and therefore there is much less accountability. There is like, there might be very strong invisible powers that I'm not aware of, you know? And so, in some way, it's harder to collude, but but I just don't know. Like it's like I mean, in Bitcoin, there is indeed there is like those big mining pool, and you know, in the end, it's like five actors, all of them in China, um, which are very aligned interests. And so I'm not sure I'm, I'm happy to trust that more so than a very well crafted consortium blockchain with like differentiated actors that have conflicting interests and therefore are more, less likely to collude and that are very accountable to their decisions. You know what I mean? So there is like, it's, it's complex to say which one is more trustworthy, uh, but for sure one is uh, very difficult to, to coordinate. And that kind of is what makes it more, more, that creates the expectation that is less likely to change. But as we have seen with Ethereum, it's not necessarily the case. And, and as we have seen with, with Bitcoin as well, because uh, the, the network has forked. Um, and to answer your second question, because it's actually very important, is uh, uh, so the, 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 um, the miners uh, are the only one that can uh, create blocks. So they, are, they choose uh, what transaction to put inside and which transaction not to process um, and, and when. Um, so to a large extent, they, they actually have a lot of power in terms of censorship, right? They can, they can really literally choose not to process a particular transaction. The validator will not know. What the miner can't do is uh, changing the protocol, right? So the, the miner cannot, if the miner change the protocol and therefore validate transactions, which are not according to the rules of the protocol, all the validators will reject that block. And that means that the miners have just been wasting a lot of processing power and therefore money validating blocks that they know will never be accepted by the validators. And so in terms of like, so when we're talking about censorship, miners have huge, huge, huge power. They have like all the power. Uh, right. When we're talking about protocol changes, the validators have all the power. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, more questions um, or should I go? Um, Tony, I know, so, so let, me, let me go with my uh, uh, question. What I'm trying to understand is governance and regulatory systems. And I wonder how, the, uh, how blockchain, blockchain research uh, changed the view, our view uh, on governance and regulation in, in general. I understand it extends um, the possibilities, uh, the options that we, we have in, in order to understand governance regulation, 
but does it change our uh, regulation and governance theory more generally? Does it change your view of law or uh, politics uh, uh, after studying uh, blockchain more generally? Um. Um, it's a complex question. Uh, I'm trying to decide what I want to answer. <laughs> um, I, so, I, can tell you, I can tell you where it comes from. So I'm, I'm doing this handbook of, uh, of regulation and governance of emerging technology. Yeah. So one, so one, 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 one goal is to you know make uh, new technologies more uh, kind of accessible for regulation, public policy, scholars, lawyers, etc. But on the other hand, I want to, to, to know in which way is those new technologies change our, our views or vision or preferences to certain governance uh, arrangements? Yeah, um, so I can give you like two answers that uh, like, I mean, yes, I think, I, think, I think the answer is yes and no, depending on what you're looking at. So. Uh, I don't think those like there, there is a lot of claims, uh, at least in the early days, that uh, blockchain technology will we we can get rid of governments because everything is going to be through a smart contract and stuff like that. And this the answer. My answer is no. Um, we cannot get rid of most of our institutions, including financial institutions, with blockchain because because there is all this like you cannot not everything can be done via confidence. There is only a subset of things that can be. That we can that we want to be confident about but there is a lot of things that actually inherently require trust and and we actually want those those relationship of trust and therefore we want those institution and i mean and we're seeing it today with the blockchain where there is more and more intermediaries that are popping up because people don't want to be responsible for managing their own funds and uh, they actually want to rely on more expert and text individual that will that will have their own that provide their own banks for uh, for for cryptocurrency right so there is like this 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 broad vision that uh, that because everything can be codified into a blockchain or a smart contract we don't need uh the traditional mechanism of government and governance i think is uh, is a very naive uh vision of the technology because i don't think the technology is nearly um as capable of that on the other hand i would like to answer yes to your question on on at least two facets but very narrow facets uh one and this is actually a little bit the core of my research is like the extent to which um the the technological guarantees that are provided by blockchain technology can actually be used to achieve specific regulatory objectives in a way that could actually render existing laws and regulation, some of them, uh, obsolete. Uh, and so as a very simple example, you can take the example of like um, audits, right? And, and reporting, financial reporting, like for banks and financial institutions. So there is like a lot of formalities, a lot of layers of oversight, auditing, et cetera, that are there because we need to trust those institutions. They are like fiduciary institution and we don't really trust them. And therefore we create those layers of regulation in order to increase the confidence in their operation. Uh, but if, if a bank was to actually use a blockchain um, as opposed to their own personal database, then by simply, by the simple fact that they are actually using a blockchain, then you can just look at the blockchain and you know for a fact that no one, like you don't need any audits, you don't need any reporting and oversight because by simply looking at the blockchain, because you know the bank could not tamper with its own database, then you know that the bank cannot claim to have done a transaction that does not appear on the blockchain or vice versa, the, the bank cannot pretend not to have done a transaction which actually is recorded on the blockchain. And so there is like all this question about how do we achieve uh, regulatory compliance, which could be done perhaps more efficiently, or like at least with less layers of, um, of oversight via a blockchain technology, and therefore perhaps kind of like recognizing uh, a regulatory equivalence between those. And so if I decide to constrain myself by adopting uh, a blockchain technology within my, uh, my own system, then perhaps I could benefit from uh, a lesser 
regulatory burden because I'm actually complying with the, the, the regulatory objective through technological means, as opposed to through all the formalities that are usually required. And so I think there is like a lot of uh, very interesting uh, potential that uh, blockchain technology provides with regard to uh, how do we, how, how can we transpose? And it's not about codifying law into technology because I think this is like also very dangerous, but it's more about finding ways in which a particular technological construct and the guarantees that come with it actually fulfill a specific objective and then recognizing an, equi an equivalent between them and then leaving up to the different actors. Would you rather be highly regulated and use your own technological system or would you like to adopt a blockchain based infrastructure and reduce a little bit the burden uh, for all the all the regulatory oversight. Uh, so that's answer one. And the other answer, um, and it relates to more like the governance question um, in terms of polycentricity. So there is uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, thinking that has been done about like how how do we manage those polycentric system, and um, there is this general belief uh, that uh, that that distributed coordination is is very very difficult to achieve with no system of monitoring archive surveillance and without sanctioning systems right and uh, and the interesting thing about the blockchain is that it's um it provides an alternative ways of actually achieving perhaps those two functions but differently meaning that instead of monitoring or surveillance we can actually rely on ex post verifiability right so i don't need to constantly monitor actors as long as i know that there is proof of what everyone is doing and only when something happens i can go and i can check and i can verify who has done what so it, it reduced the need for surveillance and yet it achieved the same objective that can enable this distributed and uh, and polycentric governance and same thing with with regard to sanctioning which is ex post sanctioning with blockchain technology you can actually have this deterministic computation and so you actually have ex ante automation and so i don't need to sanction because actually violating the rules is just not possible in the first place and by combining this ex post verifiability and ex ante automation uh, i think uh, it could possible to actually explore those new mechanisms of uh, polycentric governance without having to incorporate the monitoring and the sanctioning within it. Thank you very much. And uh, one more question from Sarah. Please unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Yes, hi. Thanks very much, Primavera. I really enjoyed that presentation. It's given me a lot to, to think about and to digest. Um, I was wondering um, whether in some sectors blockchain is too novel a technology to act as a confidence machine yet, or whether there are some sectors where th there needs to be a sort of imported or reflected confidence from more well-established institutions that have that confidence. And the reason I ask that is that um, I'm one of a team working on blockchain to share healthcare data for individuals to decide to share their own healthcare data with researchers. And there's quite a lot of buy-in to the idea that people want to, to share their own um, data for that. But what we've been finding, and there are some other members of the group on the, on the call, um, from our focus groups is that, um, potential participants, potential data donors, want to see more traditional forms of governance in a blockchain setting to have confidence in it. So they want more oversight. Um, and so, for example, one of the things that they've said is that, you know, there could be a way of um, using our National Health Service, the NHS, uh, which is seen as a really trusted institution to oversee some of the transactions. And the irony there is that the NHS is really poor at data management, data protection, and so on. So there are aspects of blockchain that, which would overcome that, but we don't yet have the confidence in blockchain um, for, them, for them to, at the moment, say that they're willing to do that. So I wonder whether there are any examples in those early 
stages where confidence isn't is, doesn't yet exist of reflected confidence from other institutions being used to to build that up or uh, yeah, I mean, of course, like I think half of the population doesn't really fully understand uh, blockchain technology, and like right now, it's 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 everyone is interested in it, and very few people are willing to experiment. Or like it's a lot, a lot of industry have done like hundreds and thousands of proof of concept, but no one has actually adopted it uh, in like in the industrial world and stuff like that. Um, and I think personally, I think it's uh, it's not lack of confidence. I think it's actually a lack of trust in the underlying governments. I, I, I do think like anyone that actually has um, basic technical understanding of how the technology works has confidence in it. But but and I think it's very fair. It's like it's it's not enough to have confidence in like you can only have confidence in technology if you actually trust the underlying layer. And I think most most companies, most institutions they actually don't want to trust anyone else but themselves, right? And, and, and maybe for very good reasons, actually. So um, I think like the, to me, like the, the, the first adoption, and this, this actually has been the case in like the industrial world and, and like banks and so forth, they create their own consortium. They actually create their own blockchain where they are part of the government structure and then they can trust this government structure. So to me, the problem of adoption is not because of lack of confidence. It's just that this confidence doesn't exist because the trust under, underneath doesn't exist. And to me, like the main thing to fix today is not necessarily providing better awareness of how the blockchain technology works, because that's actually an easy thing to do, uh, is actually proving or providing better governance structures for those blockchains so that this initial layer of trust exists and therefore can create the confidence in the overall system. Thanks, that's really helpful. Thank you very much all. Thank you very much, uh, Primavera. A fascinating uh, presentation. We all, uh, I think, appreciate it. Um, and uh, I will say uh, thank you again to all. And we meet again in this series, uh, January 21, with Claudia Williamson on trust and business uh, regulation across countries. Stay with me after I finish the recording. And I will say thank you and good evening. <laughs>